Finally, in this first letter to the Corinthians, Paul shows both his frustration with the Corinthians and his passion for them. Everything he has been telling them since chapter 1 of this letter comes to a head in verse 31 of this 7th chapter. And with utmost clarity and with utmost passion, Paul shows them where he wants them to go as citizens of the kingdom of God. His vision for them and us becomes crystal clear. you got to stay with us for this one. I'll be right back. Good evening. This is session 27 in our study of 1 Corinthians. In my walk with Christ, I'm experiencing what the Apostle Peter called joy unspeakable and full of glory. Throughout the days, I break out in worship at just about any time. And yet, amidst that joy, we find that there are serious matters in the Christian life that are not about joy. Sometimes we face difficulties when, for example, Christians do not behave as they should. We do not behave as we should. Either because they or we don't know how, or we just don't want to. And that's what this first letter to the Corinthians is all about. It's about behaviors that are not acceptable in the kingdom of God and how to correct them. This seventh chapter of this letter has been especially difficult as we try to sort out the guidance we receive about marriage, sex, divorce, and remarriage. And the passage we are examining tonight is no exception. Paul is continuing to educate this congregation regarding marriage issues. So let's pray together and we'll begin. Heavenly Father, thank you for our time to study your word together. And we know that this passage is challenging. We ask you, Lord, to come and help us sort it all out and remember what we've learned, and live by what we've learned. Thank you, Lord, for your grace to us, your love and mercy upon us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Let me begin tonight by correcting an interpretive statement I made last week. In verse 15 of the seventh chapter, the Apostle Paul wrote, But if the unbeliever, unbelieving partner separates, let it be so. In such a case, the brother or sister has, is not bound. It is to peace that God has called you. When Paul said that the brother or sister is not bound when the unbelieving spouse separates, I interpreted that to mean that the believing spouse is free to remarry. That is, in fact, the interpretation held by the Roman Catholic Church and has been down through the centuries. But it is by no means the position held by the Church Universal. In fact, a careful examination of, of the verse leads many to believe that Paul was not giving the divorced person liberty re to remarry. He was merely saying that if the unbelieving spouse decides to separate, then the believing spouse is not obligated to try to save the marriage. He or she is free. But Paul was not giving that person freedom to remarry. Now, this interpretation is strengthened by Paul's words elsewhere in this chapter. In chapter 7, verse 39, Paul wrote, A wife is bound as long as her husband lives, but if the husband dies, she is free to, be, to marry anyone she wishes only in the Lord. He doesn't say a wife is bound to her husband as long as he is her husband. She is bound to him until he dies. Is there an exception to this? Yes. Adultery. So, if a man divorces his wife, she is not free to remarry. And if a wife divorces her husband, which was highly unlikely in those days, he is not free to remarry either. But if the one who divorced the spouse remarries, or otherwise enter into, enters an adulterous relationship, then the believing uh, former spouse is free 
to remarry. And that's true of, of any situation, whether they're believers or not. If, the, if one spouse commits adultery, then the other one is free to remarry. So let me give you an example. Let's take a hypothetical case. Richard, an unbeliever, is married to Jennifer. He decides he doesn't like Jennifer's Christianity, so he leaves her and eventually divorces her. Jennifer doesn't want the divorce, but she has no obligation to fight for the marriage since her husband is an unbeliever. When the divorce is final, Jennifer is not free to remarry, however. In God's eyes, her covenant relationship with her husband is still in force. However, if her husband begins a sexual relationship with another woman, whether or not he marries that other woman is immaterial, he's committing adultery. And that adulterous relationship allows Jennifer to marry someone else. In Romans chapter 7, verse 2, Paul repeats what he had said in this letter. Thus, a married woman is bound by the law to her husband as long as he lives. But if her husband dies, she is discharged from the law concerning the husband. Paul's view of the sanctity of marriage is without compromise. All right, we can now move on to verse 17. But remember that verse 17, while the beginning of another paragraph, is still connected to what has been said in the previous paragraph. And what we see here is Paul continuing to impress upon these believers to live out their Christian life in whatever setting or circumstance they were in when they became believers. Verse 17. However that may be, let each of you lead the life that the Lord has assigned to which God called you. This is my rule in all the churches. Remember that Paul wrote in verse 15 that it was to peace God had called them. But such peace was elusive to these Corinthians, because they could not settle matters regarding marriage, sex, divorce, and other matters pertaining to their present state, whatever state that was. Should I marry? Should I not marry? Should I remain married? Should I divorce? If I remain married, should I, have, uh, should I be having sexual relations with my spouse, or should I live a celibate life? All kinds of questions that brought turmoil into the minds of these believers. Now, Paul answered their questions by writing that each of you lead the life that the Lord has assigned to which God calls you. This is my rule in all the churches. Now, this, this issue may have come up in other churches, and that is why Paul has mentioned it in, in those churches. What he means here is that each person is to walk with Christ in the position that person had when God called him or her, that is, when that person became a believer. Be at peace where you are and what you are in Christ, he was saying. In verse 18, Paul gives another way people were disturbed in this congregation. There were Jews living in this Christian community where most of the men were circumcised who were asking themselves if they had made a mistake in being circumcised, even if that circumcision was done before they believed in Christ. They would worry over this as if there was a way for them to become uncircumcised. And so that's why Paul says, uh, don't, don't try to be uncircumcised, as if, they, as if they could. Likewise, there were Gentile believers who were wondering if they needed to be circumcised. In verses 18 and 19, Paul made a remarkable statement considering his history of being a Pharisee, a remarkable statement about circumcision. Listen to what he wrote. Was anyone at the time of his call already circumcised? Let him not seek to remove the marks of circumcision. Was anyone at the time of his call uncircumcised? Let him not seek circumcision. Now watch this. Circumcision is nothing. And uncircumcision is nothing. Wow, those are, that's a remarkable statement. But obeying the commandments of God is everything. Now, why is circumcision nothing? Because it was an external physical sign of the covenant. The days of external symbols and signs are over. What God is concerned about is the internal, the heart. And so Paul uh, uh, speaks elsewhere about the circumcision of the heart. So all believers today are called to obey the commandments of God in everything the moral standards that God has set for the kingdom of God. 
but they do not obey the ceremonial standards like circumcision. So that's what's important. Let each of you remain in the condition in which you were called. He's not telling people not to get married or to get married. What he is saying is that they are to be at peace with God without making changes in their status to please him. Now, God had called them to peace. So they would, should stop fretting about minor matters and make no changes in their status if such changes were an attempt to please God. God was not displeased with the single or the married. They should not divorce their spouses. But if their spouses should divorce them, they should look at their single status as a gift from God in the same way that marriage was a gift from God. In fact, Paul says, whatever you are, look at it as a gift from God. In verses 21 to 24, he raised another issue in which there was discontent among some of the believers there. Were you a slave when you were called? Were you a slave when you became a believer? Do not be concerned about it. Even if you can gain your freedom, make use of your present condition now more than ever. Now, what does he mean, make use of your present condition now more than ever? Well, he means use your present status to bear witness of your faith in Christ, both in words and in your behavior. Remember Jesus' words in the Sermon on the Mount? Listen. You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist an evildoer. But if anyone strikes you on the right cheek, turn, turn the other also. And if anyone wants to sue you and take your coat, give your cloak as well. And if anyone forces you to go one mile, go also the second mile. Now Jesus wasn't talking only to servants here. But the principle does apply to those who are servants. Before you became a believer, you resisted the orders of your owners, Paul was saying. But now, as a believer in Christ, who loved you, love your owner with the love of Christ. Turn the other cheek. Go the extra mile. See your status as a slave or a servant as a gift, an opportunity to reach someone for Christ. Verse 22. For whoever was called in the Lord as a slave is a freed person belonging to the Lord. So, in other words, you may be a, a slave to a person, but in reality, you are free because you are in the Lord. And then he goes on to say, just as whoever was free when called is a slave of Christ. In Christ, you are both free and you are a slave. You are free from the penalty and the power of sin and you are a bond slave to Christ. Don't look at the slaveholder with anger. Look at him with compassion and see him as part of your mission field. Love him into the kingdom of God. And so what's Paul talking about here? Well, he's talking about evangelistic opportunities as gifts from God. And those evangelistic opportunities ought to be a concern for every believer. We are doing the work of evangelism when we seek to present the gospel of Christ to someone to bring them to faith. In this case, Paul pinpointed the relationship that a servant or a slave has with his or her owner or master. A traditional unbelieving slave would resent his position and resent his owner. His goal would be to escape the bondage of slavery because being a slave is a very difficult position. It's difficult because we resent it, we resist it, we hate it. We are not going to do the best job for someone we just can't stand. Now that's the thinking of the unbeliever. But it's not the thinking of the citizen of the kingdom of God. Romans 8.28 says, We know that God works all things together for good to those who love him and are called according to his purpose. Yes, even your role as a slave or servant is, is one of the ways that God can work all things together for good. The citizen of the kingdom of God serves Christ first. And in all that he does, he seeks to reveal Christ to those around him. When he becomes a believer and grows in his faith, then his behavior changes and everyone notices it. The quality of his work changes, his attitude changes. Now what Paul has in mind here obviously does not apply only to slaves and their masters. 
It applies to anyone who works under someone else's authority. The boss, the supervisor, the superintendent, whatever that person may be called. In fact, it applies to our relationship with co-workers and those over whom we have authority as well. God calls us to do a certain kind of work in our jobs. What kind of work is that? The best work, the extra mile kind of work, the kind of work that will bring glory and honor to him. So, in all situations, remember that you are an ambassador for Christ. You represent him with the intention of so revealing Christ to others that they will come to have faith in him as you have. Now, Paul ends this section with, those, with these encouraging words in verses 23 and 24. Listen. You were bought with a price. Do not become slaves of human masters. In other words, he's saying to those who are servants or slaves, don't think of yourself as a slave of a human master. In whatever condition you were called, brothers and sisters, there remain with God. And then, and in doing so, you'll have your freedom. Now, I remind you of what I've been saying during all these lessons in, on chapter 7. Paul is convinced that Jesus is going to return in his lifetime. And that is why he, he is so constant in his missionary work. He doesn't quit. So when he says, in whatever condition you were called, brothers and sisters, they remain with God, he doesn't think he's talking about a lifetime. It might be just a few years before Jesus um, returns. He may not know how long it will be exactly before Jesus returns, but it won't be so long that a person cannot continue to live in the state that person was in when he or she came to Christ. No one, or, or almost no one, thinks they ought to remain in the, in the state or condition they were in when they, when they came to Christ today, in the church today because we do change. We marry, we have children, we change jobs, we retire, and otherwise go through the events of life. Life is full of changes. In whatever state we are, we live for the glory of Christ. All right, let's move on to the next paragraph in this chapter. And let me tell you up front that this paragraph has been, so, it's been very difficult to interpret, not only for me, but for Bible scholars down through, century, through history. One of the problems found with this paragraph is found in verse 25. So let me read it to you. Now concerning virgins, I have no command of the Lord, but I give my opinion as one who by the Lord's mercy is trustworthy. Now before we look at that problem, let me comment on Paul's initial statement in this verse. I have no command of the Lord, but I give my opinion as one who by the Lord's mercy is trustworthy. Notice that Paul doesn't say, I'm giving you my opinion as an apostle of Christ. He doesn't, say that, he doesn't say that he's not appealing to his authority in Christ as an apostle when he makes a statement. He's not pulling rank on them. What he's appealing to is the fact that God has had mercy on him, and likewise, he is taking a merciful attitude toward them as he answers their questions. Now let's go back to the problem of the verse. The problem in this verse lies with the definition of the word virgin. We define a virgin as someone who has not had sexual relations. But if we hold to that definition, then this paragraph makes no sense. In verse 27, Paul wrote, Are you bound to a wife? Do not seek to be free. Are you free from a wife? Do not seek, do not seek a wife. Wait a minute. I thought Paul was going to write about virgins in this paragraph. How did he end up talking about those who are married? We do get some help in understanding Paul's message here by the two brief questions he asks in verse 27. The help comes in the form of a different but perfectly legitimate translation. Listen to Donald Gee's translation of these two questions. Are you pledged to a woman? This would be the equivalent of our word engaged. We can assume that the hypothetical man who is engaged is a virgin. So we're, we're on track as to what Paul was going to talk about in this paragraph. Paul says, if you are engaged, do not seek to break the engagement. His second question, are you free from such a commitment? In other words, are you a virgin who is not engaged 
but perhaps you would like to be married someday. If you are a virgin who is not engaged, Paul says, do not look for a wife. And then Paul repeats what he had already told the Corinthian people earlier. In verse 28, he wrote, But if you marry, you do not sin. If a virgin marries, she does not sin. And then he gives this final caution, that those who marry will experience distress in this life, and I will spare you that stress. So he does stay on theme in light of the, these two questions that he raises to them. He's still talking about virgins. Now, when he talks about the distress that a person will have in marriage, he's not referring to the stress all marriages experience. He's referring to, uh, quite possibly, to the unnamed crisis he mentioned in verse 26 and or the crisis of Christ's sudden return. And he expresses his belief that Christ's return is getting closer and closer in verses 29 to 31. Let me read those to you. I mean, brothers and sisters, the appointed time has grown short. From now on, let even those who have wives be as though they had none, and those who mourn as though they were not mourning, and those who rejoice as though they were not rejoicing, and those who buy as though they had no possessions, and those who deal with the world as though they had no dealings with it. For the present form of this world is passing away. Well, there's an amazing statement, isn't it? What's he saying here? Are you familiar with the word hyperbole? Hyperbole means exaggeration for effect. So Paul is trying to impress upon his readers that their relationship with the world can no longer be as it was before they came to faith in Christ, and he uses hyperbole, exaggeration, to make his point. They are divorced from the world in order that they may be married to Christ. Thus, their perspective on life in this world has changed, or at least it must change. So in a dramatic way, he drives home his point, and you sense that Paul had become somewhat emotional as he wrote these words. There's a tone of jealousy here, if you will, in Paul's writing. He's jealous for Christ. He's jealous for the kingdom of God. His readers have written to him endless questions about how they should live in this world, and he has attempted to give them some guidance, but now he seems to realize that his readers have one foot in the kingdom of God and the other in the world, and they're slipping more into the world all the time. If he were in their presence and he had gone through all of, of these questions and answers, I wonder if he would have finally blurted out to them, Look, let even those who have wives be as though they had none, and those who mourn as though they were not mourning, and those who rejoice as though they were not rejoicing, and those who buy as though they had not, no possessions, and those who deal with the world as though they had no dealings with it. For the present form of this world is passing away. Why are you trying to live in the world when the present form of this world is passing away? In other words, he's saying, stop making plans to live in this world. Divorce yourself from this world, because whether Christ comes soon or not, this present world is passing away. We're not here to live in the world. We're here to transform it. Don't think of yourselves as residents of this world. Think of yourselves as God's agents, God's ambassadors to transform the world. Now, all of this takes us back to the earliest chapters of this book, where Paul rebukes these Corinthians for pursuing vain philosophies and worldly wisdom. They were slipping back in the world then, weren't they? Paul was saying in those chapters, stop going in the direction of the world. Turn around. Go in the opposite direction. Repent. Have a change of mind. And here in these verses, Paul is telling his readers to stop, freeze, and think about your relationship with this world. Stop conforming to it and start embracing your citizenship in the kingdom of God. What a point Paul makes. And it's a point we would be wise to listen to. We don't know when Jesus is going to return, but we ought to live our lives as, as though he could return at any time. And we ought to divorce ourselves from the world anyway and realize that we are ambassadors for Christ and we are living in his territory.
And we are surrounded by the world, but we don't want to become part of it. We are in the world, but we are not of the world. We are ambassadors for Christ, and we represent him in all that we do. Let's pray. O oh, Father in heaven, we, we hear Paul. We, we hear Paul's heart today. His anxiety over a church that has been drifting into the world. And he wants to impress upon them and he wants to impress upon us to divorce ourselves from the world, to stop trying to live in it, but rather spend our lives trying to transform it by being representatives of Christ. Help us, Lord, to be that kind of believer, that kind of Christian. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, let me remind you that we will not have a study next week. I'll be conducting five services in the churches I serve as pastor from Palm Sunday onward. So it will be both a busy time and a time of great celebration. And I pray that God will give you a most meaningful Holy Week and a great celebration of Easter. I look forward to seeing you in two weeks. God bless. Thank you.